It's a beautiful morning, Nigeria. Welcome to Daybreak, reaching you live from the nation's capital in Abuja. I am Ayuba Ilya. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Stella. Good morning, Ayuba, and good morning, Nigerians, for joining us. It's indeed a beautiful morning, especially with the rain through the night. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, very uh, good weather uh, for you to catch some sleep, but unfortunately, Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got a lot to do, then it's time to get off the bed and go uh, get busy to get the things undone, uh, done because time is ticking and it's not on our side. Is mm -hmm. it? All right, now let's take a look at the headlines today. Uh, Banditry Matawale insists on self defense, inaugurates committees, deploys vehicles, bikes. Salah Sultan directs Muslims to look out for new moon. Landlords who have Yahoo Boys as tenants risk 15 years jail terms, says the EFCC. Now the news in details. Now Governor M Bello Mataole of Zamfara State has inaugurated four committees on security matters and provided 20 brand new Hilux vehicles and 1,500 motorbikes for commencement of operations. The press secretary to the governor, Jamilu Ilyas Umagaji, disclosed it on Tuesday. The committees are Special Committee on Intelligence Gathering on Banditry, Management Committee on Operations of the Community Protection Guards, Committee on Prosecution of Banditry-Related Offenses, and State Security Standing Committee. Matawale said the establishment of the committees was part of the tireless efforts of his administration to address the prolonged prog problem of banditry plaguing the state and other states in the northwest zone. Al-Haji Saad Abubakar III, the Sultan of Sokoto and President General of Nigeria Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, has directed the Muslim Umar to look out for the new moon of Dhul Hijjah as from Wednesday. The Sultan made the call in a statement signed by Professor Sambo Junaidu, Chairman, Advisory Committee on Religious Affairs, Sultanate Council of Sokoto. He also prayed to Allah to assist the Muslim Ummah in discharging their religious duties. Uh, the Hijjah is the 12th and last month in Islamic calendar where the holy pilgrimage takes place as well as the Eid Kabir festival of sacrifice. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, has vowed to go after landlords who rent their houses to internet fraudsters, better known as Yahoo Boys. The commission made this known ahead of its next edition of its public conversation series tagged EFCC Connect, which has been slated for 6 p.m. on Wednesday. The topic, Give Your House to Yahoo Boys, Spend 15 Years in Jail, will be discussed by the commission's legal and prosecution officers, Severus Tahir and Cosmos Ugu. Daily Trust reports that the EFCC had repeatedly warned house owners and commercial real estate agents against making properties available to cyber criminals and fraud stars. Right, let's take a look at some packages. President Muhammad Buhari says the All Progressives Congress will reconcile all parties aggrieved as a result of the party's nationwide primaries well ahead of the 2023 elections. He spoke on Tuesday at the State House in Abuja when he met with a delegation of APC senators. Kendi Amodu reports. The APC is in dire straits given the number of persons appealing the results of its recently concluded primaries. A quick peek at the number of appeals arising from the exercise reveals that there are over 47 cases in the South-South, 10 in the Southeast, 4 in the Southwest, and that is not the end of the list. President Buhari is very much aware of the state of things. The leadership of the party is currently addressing the outcomes as part of the way forward. I am encouraging all the party functionaries to adhere to the truth and to be fair to all parties in any dispute. This is important because our strength and victory in the election lies in the unity of the party and our ability to prevent or heal any injustice Real. And he is giving assurances that justice will prevail. Aggrieved members shall be assured 
and the interests of the party and the nation shall be protected. The sooner the ruling party resolves this looming internal crisis, the better. Or there could be dire consequences. In fact, whispers indicate that about 22 senators are aggrieved by the primaries in the Senate. And they are all threatening to explore a plan B if they don't get justice. It could mean that going into the 2023 elections, the ruling party may lose its majority in the Red Chamber. From State House Abuja, Kainde Amudu, Trust TV News. All right, thank you, Kainde Amudu, for that report. Now, the Federal High Court has again dismissed the application for bail filed by Inam Dekano, leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, IPOP. Justice Bintayako, while ruling on the application on Tuesday, termed it an abuse of court process, an attempt to re-litigate on issues already decided by the court. Madia Umar brings us the report. Kanu, who is currently facing a seven-count charge had in the application filed through his lawyers, led by Mike Ozokambe, senior advocate of Nigeria, equally challenged the revocation of the bail the court earlier granted him. Cancel to the defendant, Mike Ozokambe, therefore told the court that a notice of appeal challenging the competence of the remaining seven counts in the charge against his client be struck out and the suit discharged. So what we have done is that apart from appealing, we have also timelessly compiled the record of proceedings and sent to the Court of Appeal. And the appeal has been duly entered at the Court of Appeal. Going by order 5, rule 10 of the Court of Appeal rules, this court, Federal High Court, ceases to have jurisdiction over the matter. Because there can't be two obas or two Aziz or two emirs in one palace, a federal high court cannot frontally confront the jurisdiction of the Court of Appeal. David Caswell is the prosecution lawyer. Just to tell you briefly what transpired in court this afternoon, you saw that uh, the matter today was actually adjourned for the court to deliver its ruling on the application that was earlier filed by the defendant. What is the content of that application? That the court should vacate its earlier order that the court made so that the defendant can be tried in absentia. And we oppose that application, that that particular application is dead upon arrival. Why is it dead upon arrival? The person that was, that, that, that John Bill, and then the security forces were able to bring him back to face his trial, then there will be no need for that application because the application has been overtaken by events. He's physically there. And then let's continue with the trial. Justice Iyako later adjourned till 14th November 2022, pending the outcome of the proceedings at the Court of Appeal. Martia Umar, Trust TV News Abuja. All right, now moving on. Issues around the Electoral Act came to the front burner at the opening of plenary this Tuesday. Senate President Ahmed Lawan had said that the National Assembly will work towards amending the Electoral Act to serve as safeguard against weaknesses identified in the law. Take a look. The Senate President Ahmed Lawa, in a short remark on Tuesday during plenary, Assured of the amendment to the Electoral Act following a matter of national importance brought to the floor by Senator Yaya Abdullahi. Rising under Order 42 of the Senate Standing Orders, Senator Abdullahi lauded the Ninth Assembly for resisting the pressure from the Executive to amend Section 84, Subsection 12 of the Electoral Act 2022. He also applauded the Supreme Court for the clarity in the verdict upholding the separation of powers principle entrenched in the 1999 Constitution. The Supreme Court verdict should be celebrated for two reasons. The first one is that it restored and uncaused the power of making laws in the National Assembly. The second one is that it established a principle that once a president assents to a bill, he or she cannot appropriate and reprobate.
he or she cannot go to the courts to amend or reject the bill in part or in whole. This is a major principle that has emerged from this particular judgment. Lawal, in his remarks, described the judgment by the Supreme Court on Section 84, subsection 12 of the Electoral Act as a landmark judgment that vindicates the National Assembly. The electoral processes and procedures in our country. So it's for us to ensure that where there are weaknesses, we try to come up with measures, amendments, to deal with issues of weaknesses in the law. And I'm sure it will come full cycle by the time the 2023 20, general elections are held. The APS call had on Friday struck out a suit filed by President Mamadou Buhari and his Attorney General Abubakar Malami to challenge the controversial Section 84, Subsection 12 of the Electoral Act. All right. I, th I think the, when are we ever going to uh, put pace to the issue of the Electoral Act? Well, hopefully soon, maybe after the uh, elections in 2023. Okay. All right, let's take a short break and then we'll be back right after. Please stay with us. As the 2023 elections draw near, remember, evil prospers when good men and women only wish for peace, but never take a step to make peaceful elections happen. Are you a father? Are you a mother? What are you saying to your children as elections approach? Have you warned them not to let themselves be used to cause violence? Have you explained to them what the consequences of electoral violence might be? Do your part to make peaceful elections happen. Talk to your children. Protect them from unscrupulous politicians who want to put them in harm's way while their own children are comfortable at home, within and outside the country. Let's join hands to make 2023 elections peaceful. This message is from the National Orientation Agency, NOAA. To every politician, as the campaigns gain momentum and passions begin to rise, remember the errors of your opponents do not make you a success. Do not run down your opponent and inflame passions to violence between and among your supporters. What counts is what you plan to do for the electorate and how you intend to relieve the sufferings and bring succor. Nigeria is in dire need of patriotic leaders at all levels. Leaders who will make national development their priority. Concentrate on telling the electorate what you intend to do when you get into office. Focus on making your vision clear to the electorate. Don't engage in verbal abuses, fake news or speeches. Keep dealing with issues that will bring progress. You win the hearts and minds of the people by being above board, by being civil, patriotic and showing empathy. Let's join hands to make the 2023 elections peaceful. A message from the National Orientation Agency.
in a situation where you find that they must look at like the same It's not necessarily uh, a tribal or regional Thank you for staying. We go straight into the dailies this morning to have a sense of the stories on the front pages of our newspapers this morning. We have in the studio our guest reviewer, Ben Sheman, director of news, Voice of Nigeria. Thank you for joining us on Daybreak. Thank you, Ilya. All Once right. again, always a pleasure. You're welcome. All right. Now, let's begin with Daily Trust newspaper. It leads with the story that says, Hajj. Five days to deadline, less than half of Nigerian pilgrims are lifted. The writer says Saudi Arabia rejects request for additional slots. Intended pilgrims protest in Kano. Operators, 3.3 billion naira hanging. And then you also have, uh, beside the pictorial there, oh, by the way, the pictorial shows you uh, the intending pilgrims protest uh, exclusion in Kano yesterday. Uh, they are agitating that uh, they need more seats to be allocated to Kano State as that the available seats uh, did not accommodate uh, all of them that have paid uh, to be uh, lifted. Now, you also have uh, beside that Niger Insurance Standard Alliance lose licenses uh, over failure to settle claims. No going back on self-defense, materially too hit by stray bullets in army police clash in Bayasa. You also have uh, below that aftermath of APC primaries. Buhari weighs in as 22 aggrieved senators insist on defection. 75 court cases trail exercise in states. Ruling parties control of parliament threatened. And then above the lead story, bandits sack 30 Zamfara communities, issue quick notice to five plateau villages. NCDC puts Nigerians on monkeypox red alert. PDP backs Media Trust 2023 elections debate. These are the top stories uh, on our papers today, the Daily Trust. Now let's look at the top stories on the leadership newspapers. It has a late story that says, aftermath of primaries, save APC from collapse. PMB begs aggrieved senators, others. There's a writer that says, party must not lose majority status in NAS. Leaves for Portugal to attend UN Ocean Conference. We will still amend electoral act before 2023 polls. That is coming from the Senate president. Then at the top, we have a story that says, Nigeria generates 200 billion naira, seven million dollars from marginal field sales. And up right above the masthead, Matawale signs anti banditry kidnapping cattle rustling bill. Zohija Sultan asks Muslims to look out for new moon. And we also have another story here that says eight years after Jonathan Six implementation of the 2014 Confab report. Also, at the left-hand side of the paper, there is a story that court dismisses Kanu's fresh bill application. Organ harvesting, reps vow to ensure justice for Ekwere Madu, wife. Then there's also another story there that says, federal government raises task on tobacco products to 30%. Those are the major stories on leadership for today. All right, now, if you take a look at the national economy, this first story there at the very top, you see operational costs forced firms to prune down workforce by 40%. That's according to MAN, Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. The lead story says investors seek better yields as 17.6% inflation subdues fixed income investments. And then at the very bottom there, marginal fields, NU, NUPRC awards licenses uh, to M Metrics Energy, 160 others. Uh, NICOM revokes licenses of Niger Insurance Standard uh, Alliance. So 
uh, that's that uh, for the national economy. And the Guardian newspaper leads with uh, a story that says, Nigeria risk financial blockade, frosty relations with funders. And there's a writer there that says, World Bank calls for sovereign debt charges ahead of looming recession. That's at the top, there's a story there that says, NICOM revokes licenses of two insurance firms, appoints receivers liquidators. WHO wants, mon wants monkeypox could become pandemic like COVID-19. There's another story there that says, APC Guba Asper and Sue's call wants reverse primary cancelled. Tension in Delta as soldiers guarding oil export terminal kill youth. Still on uh, Zamfara State, there's a story there that says, Matawali signs banditry bill into law, explains call for self-defense. And at the right at the bottom, it's another story. TUC issues strike notice to fire me over unpaid workers' salary areas, others. Those are the major stories on The Guardian. Uh, if you take a look at the Nation newspaper uh, this morning, it leads with political story. It says, how APC governors edged us out by aggrieved senators. Uh, you'd find the writer that says, Buhari dangles carrot at meeting with 15 senators. Uh, Kalu defection now ruled out. Uh, you also have above the masthead Senate to probe allegations against ex-CJN. Why Kanu will remain in custody till November 14 by judge. And then two insurance firms lose operating licenses. Uh, Tinubu Hills acting CJN Ariwala's appointment. You also have uh, marginal oil fields beat nets uh, 200 billion naira and uh, 7 million dollars. Banditry, Matawali insists residents must carry guns in self-defense. So these are the stories on the front page of the Nation newspaper. And for the Punch newspaper, their list story is a bit uh, different from the other papers. It says, XCJN to get 2.5 billion naira benefits as Senate begins a corruption probe. It has a writer that says, retired CGN entitled to gratuity that's 300% of 3.36 trillion annual basic. This is based on an investigation. His earnings will be intact. He's entitled to official cars, houses, says NGC source. Mohammed battling condition before appointment. Visits Dubai for treatment. This is from a source. We also have a story there. Uh, a pictorial actually, which uh, depicts uh, adult pupils learning on bare floor, community six, government's help. And uh, there's another story here that says, strike, Abiodun, that's the Ogun State Governor, meets labor today, laments cash crunch. Then there's also another story here, exercise, exercise restraints, Buhari tells aggrieved senators. And right at the top of the masthead, we have, we will apply diplomatic pressure to help Equerimadu. This is coming from the reps. There's also another story there. Aggrieved aspirants reject INEX list, begin multiple court cases. 30 marginal fees dormant, FG awards 57 to new investors. These are the major stories on the punch for today. All right, that's that for the papers. Let's now get perspectives on some of the stories. Apparently, uh, we have more political stories dominating the front pages uh, this morning, particularly as regards the crisis in the APC. But something worrisome is happening uh, down south, and I would like to, to you know, comment on that. Take a look at uh, page 28 of the Mid Daily Trust newspaper. It talks about. Uh, two hit by stray bullets in army police clash uh, in Bayasa State. And then in Delta State as well, we're hearing that the tension uh, a soldier guarding oil export terminal kill a youth. We are talking three innocent people now killed by soldiers. Uh, you know, I mean, apparently this is not uh, talking about self-defense or anything like that. So, uh, this is extrajudicial, we could say, uh, because 
uh, first of all, the clash between the police and the army. It is now a recurring uh, phenomenon. You know, we've always seen this clash. And most times it has to do with, you know, soldiers disobeying traffic regulations or the other way around. Uh, this time around, a soldier is trying to beat the traffic, and then you have vigilante uh, boys who are controlling the traffic, uh, you know, usually in collaboration with the police. And then before you know what's happening, the soldier opens fire and two people are killed. Very unfortunate that uh, such things happen. There's always what they call, is called interagency collaboration. And uh, this is purely within, it's not even during operations. This is within a civil kind of a duty where some disagreements will just occur. And how does it occur? I want to pass. No, wait till it's your turn. No. I have a superior power, a kind of, uh, a kind of a thing. And uh, recall that during Governor Fashion last days as governor of Lagos State, a colonel was driving against traffic. And uh, the governor's uh, convoy was, was also moving at that point in time. He just stopped and said, look, governor, uh, the colonel, you just have to follow us to the office. In fact, yesterday, you know? we saw a video that went viral on social media where the governor of Lagos, Saolu, Babajide Saolu uh, asked his uh, uh, security uh, aides to arrest one a soldier who was actually driving against traffic. Uh, so it, it happened again. Exactly, and that tells you the power of the of the of the civilian. Power belongs to the people, not to those who indeed uh, hold the gun. But I uh, haven't said so. I, I think that um, there is this enormous feeling in us. If you have the gun, it does not mean you have every power. Uh, therefore, it is the story of if you want to live, let another person live. Uh, we should not, I mean, exercise what you call undue power, unnecessarily. Uh, uh, now you can see the consequences. But, but what, what, what has dying. happened in the past in similar cases like that? Uh, I mean, what happens to the disciplinary measures that ordinarily the army should be taken against its personnel for behaving in such a manner, you know. And if, you know, previous cases have been dealt with, where then do they get the guts to actually continue in this? Well, you, you see, human beings are, are different. If you check those days that uh, arm robbers were always uh, tied to a stake and shot, it has not uh, stopped uh, arm robbery. But there's just this thing, some people just feel, look, I can do it and nothing uh, will happen. Uh, in terms of trials, yes, there were instances where the military would do a dismissal and say, now go face your uh, uh, police will now take over, do your prosecution. But a situation where at the point they say, where we're going to do our own um, court martial and they do it over there, at the point some people don't get uh, to know uh, the end result, but it's always better. This is a, a murder case. Is now the commissioner of police versus the, the, the alleged murderer who indeed will have to go prove his innocence or otherwise, so that the law will always take its course. But the thing is this, this rivalry between the soldiers and the police, is it doing the country any good? In, in fact, it's really not just about soldiers and police. You also have civil defense versus the police. At the point you have the police versus customs. Should you we know, have any, only, any rivalry amongst the them? Uh, uh, it, it shouldn't be because there's always what they call uh, interagency meetings. At the point they, they try to sort out some of these things. At the point they try to know when there is joint operation, what should this agency do? What's the limitation of this one? Where this one starts, the other one st uh, and stops here, the other one takes over. So we, w w we should expect that, uh, I mean, they should imbibe that spirit and know that they are supposed to be pro-Nigerians. They are supposed to be, uh, I mean, for the citizens of Nigeria and not that they want to load it on, on the Nigerians. Those you seek to protect should also should really be protected and not that they become victims. You shouldn't go there and show what we call supremacy, who indeed is supreme. It, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be at all. And so I think that they should just imbibe service to humanity, protect life, protect property, and uh, let there be a, a very 
a stable polity, a stable society. Mm. All right. Well, uh, other stories on the papers this morning. Uh, about 22 uh, senators are said to have threatened to defect and leave the uh, APC. And then we had that meeting yesterday between those some a delegation of the senators uh, with the president, uh, Mohamed Gwari, where he now intervened. From what we are hearing, uh, that has been put to rest. But again, there are court cases that still... Uh, in courts, uh, 75 court cases uh, trailing the APC primaries. It doesn't look good for the APC ahead of the 2023 election, is it? Truly, it doesn't look good. But uh, the 22 that are saying, look, we're, we're threatening to pull out, nobody forced you to join politics. If you feel the system is now injurious to you or you failed, why don't you simply take it that way? No, they're not because saying, they're not feeling. Just a moment. No, uh, I'd like you to put it in perspective because they're not feeling that the system is injurious to them. They're feeling that all, all of them, most of them are aggrieved because of the outcome of the primaries that was had recently. Well, is, it, is the system within the party? There are indirect ways of uh, imposing candidates. Look at what you call this, uh, 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 the delegates that, that did the voting. Were they not controlled by somebody? Were there no cohesion by way of uh, coercion, by way of um, abuse of uh, money? Were there people no monitoring movements of, uh, of uh, delegates? And so within the system, look at what is happening in, in Katsina. When they say in uh, Katsina State, we are pulling out from APC. What do they say? The party lacks thank you. We keep on working for the party. We don't get uh, rewarded. And, uh, of course, when the National Assembly made a law and ensured that ministers and SAs did not uh, vote or never had the powers to vote, I mean, they forgot to also take care of themselves, the, the lawmakers, to have the power to also vote. And that was why they said, President Buhari, go amend this portion, 84, subsection 12. And the president rejected. And so the governor said, look, if you said the members of the executive should not vote, here you are. You lawmakers, you can't vote. And so if you wake up today and now say governors manipulated, you made the law and the president signed it. The president saw that there was something injurious to some people, both the executive and members of the legislature. I mean this, they refused. Only to, for them to realize within the shortest time possible, say, no, the president, go do this. And of course, the president... I mean, rejected. Some people went to court and said the president should not do it. Now the Supreme Court has said, the president, you don't even have the power after signing. You can't appropriate this kind of a power. You can't say yes and say no at the same time. It's, it's not possible. Okay, now so these are lawmakers who indeed are feeling threatened or it didn't go their way. Some other people who had it are also happy. The Senate president, Machina is insisting, look, I contested and won. There's nothing like I was holding forth for you mm. to come in case you fell. Mm. And I, of course you have failed. I am here. I was elected. I contested. And so you, did you contest? So why should I just step down? And so that's okay. why we're talking of new physiologies. Uh, I mean, you are holding that place, place and trust. You know. Okay, now the president has intervened. And it looks like they are, they, they are shitting their swords. But not necessarily so because... One of them said that, yes, they are going to go back and wait to see what will happen. And that if nothing happens, and because time is already running out, they'll have to take action. Do you really think that uh, that, that meeting was enough? Yeah, you see, well, in terms of uh, the leader of the party talking of President Muhammad Buhari, calling people, aggrieved people, Look, gentlemen, there's just one seat everyone was eyeing at. Now, if one person wins, so be it. Why don't you accept that uh, you begin to talk of what we're talking of alignment? Okay, just support us when we win. Some of you will be uh, some SAs, you'll be chairman of board, you'll be uh, ministers, you'll be all sorts of things. So there's what you call portfolio sharing before the, the event. So if you don't give them these assurances and you just say, just calm down, calm down, everything will be okay, everything will be okay, mm -hmm. then it's going to be like I've said, the issue of Katsina State, where they said APC is not... Uh, thanking them uh, uh, well, well, it's not in the place of the president to make certain promises at this point, is it? Uh, looking at the fact that this is his last... I, I uh, want to tell you this that... This is his last tenure. 
So uh, is there, are there guarantees, really, when it comes to you know, making promises? You see, when the president leaves office, he becomes those they call stakeholders. He becomes those they call uh, people, indeed, the stakeholders of that party who will always be automatic uh, of, of voters at any point in time, even though right now the act has excluded uh, many of them. But I want to tell you that this is the time for everybody to bring your cards, your demand on, on the table. If I join you this way, what do I get when we win? If you don't get that written no. and you allow some people to win, in the end you are now battling from behind to see how you, you, you it will be too late for you. But Write some of these ground. agreements. There's an issue of ground. Most of these senators are complaining of what happened in the primaries that took place in their various states. Now, can the president really change anything in those states? Well, if really they believe in the president and believe in the party, there's always what you call supremacy of the party. And of course, except where it's very, very clear that uh, it, it, the system or what was done was injurious to you. How was it injurious to you? Maybe um, when you, you put notice for INEC to, to, to go observe the election, and of course, um, your faction win, and another faction headed by maybe a governor was uh, uh, also did parallel primaries. And there was no INEC to observe. Yet, where the INEC did not observe uh, was uh, declared the winner. Mm -hmm. So it is a wrong up initial okay. when you have it that way. All right, now we have another story on the punch. The lead story says ex CJN to get 2.5 billion naira benefits. Senate begins corruption probe. So the former CJN resigned from his office. Uh, he's entitled to certain benefits accruing to 2.5 uh, billion naira. But this is a man that resigned under certain circumstances that some people are saying that uh, needs to be investigated uh, and all of that. Should we be still talking about benefits at this point? Well, he should. These are entitlements that are statutory in nature. If a chief justice of Nigeria is leaving office, these are his entitlements. Now, we are not talking of a man who was arrested, tried, convicted, so he becomes an act convict. All those um, rights that you have will have to go. But we are talking of allegation. And um, remember, 12 justices of the Supreme Court actually uh, flew the kite and that kite, um, whether it's the one that swept uh, Tanko away or um, uh, his uh, health condition is another ball game altogether. But even the man that is on, uh, coming on board, uh, uh, Ariola, mm -hmm. hearing that um, even the day he was born, he spent one year and, and, and entered primary school. In other words, there's already uh, a, a case uh, mm -hmm. against him as alleged. Uh, so, if it is true, it means uh, it's a long, long road to, to, to freedom. Uh, so having said so, if you check, some governors before they leave offices, which I think is wrong, you now make a law quickly. Uh, your entitlements, your, you must change your cars every three, three years. Uh, you have a house in Abuja that must be built under government coffers or with government coffers. You build at the state uh, level and in your... Uh, 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 village house, a uh, home, rather, you have another. So, yet you come back again, you are a minister. You come back again, you, more, you go, you are a senator. Everywhere you have some severe allowances. Some are retired civil servants who indeed you see all sorts of claims here and there. The nation's money is shrinking. They are not looking at this. Everybody is just looking at himself. I before others. It's mm. not just the best for the country. Okay, still on the punch. There's a, pic a, a picture there. Uh, Edo pupils learning on bare floor. Community six government's help. Now, this is not, this is actually a common sight in some parts of the country. Should we really be having things like this in the 21st century? Not at all. I also saw that um, a picture was, was snapped by one uh, Kefas, Stephen Kefas. Uh, it has to do with government secondary school, Kakugu, in uh, Lere local government in Kaduna State. You could see 
blown off roofs all over. And this is rainy season. And here we are in a doorstep uh, where pupils are seated on, on beer floor. And I want to also tell you that I, I've had reasons to go looking for some primaries just across the borders here in Kaduna State after Buhari, uh, Buhari here. You see that when they, they were sacking teachers at the point in Kaduna State, you see a whole school, the teachers were sacked. I can take you there and you see them. School teachers were sacked. You go to some uh, schools in, um, in um, Kauru local government around Chori area. I went there, a whole school, six classes, only one lady was posted to, to, to man the school for six classes. And so I don't, when you are revamping the education, restructuring the education, it shouldn't just be that you want to get the best of, 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 of teachers. Check Kaduna State again. Each time you find, in fact, teachers are always having it so hot. They are always, the search light is on them. Come for promotion exam, come for certificate verification, come for, okay, they have a new employment, come and write application to receive uh, employment letter. At the point, no, some of these people cannot just write. And continuously, and the system is just failing us. I, I, I think that uh, it, it, it shouldn't be. And people should also say, this nomadic education, what is the status? How many people have graduated from some of these things? So a situation where people, uh, pupils are seated under a tree on beer flow shouldn't just be. I remember when uh, Yara Adua um, uh, was governor of Katsina State. So we went for media ties and uh, same thing with Kwanko so that time. They had a common saying, say, look, if you go around and you see any school that doesn't have a roof, let us know. Anywhere you see children seated under trees and are being taught by any teacher, or they are sitting on stones, please snap, show us the exact place. I so challenge you. So we want to see a situation where some governors will just do some peer review mechanism. What is the best situation in a certain state, in a certain primary school education? Because it's the basic. If that is um, so good in that is, uh, state, shouldn't some governors go copy and mm. see what they are doing? Right. I think it should be. But the situation where, again, teachers they say they're giving you part-time jobs. Mm. At the point, I saw that some governors were looking for volunteer teachers. I mean, mm. w why should I train my, ch uh, my children to be teachers? Now I've retired. Government is calling on me to go be a volunteer teacher mm. so that All I right. begin to chop my, my, my children's <laughs> tomorrow. It shouldn't just be. All right. Okay. Uh, now, let's take a look at another story. Uh, on the front page of the Daily Trust newspaper, uh, we are saying that the governor of Zamfara State is insisting on his decision uh, for all citizens uh, who are willing to pick up arms and get licensed uh, to defend themselves against bandits' uh, attack. Now, we are saying that... Uh, he has inaugurated four committees. Uh, two, 20 vehicles have been dispatched. Uh, 1,500 motorbikes have been dispatched to various communities, I believe, uh, to uh, defend themselves. Now, we've heard from the chief of defense staff who said that the governor has no right uh, to uh, give such directives uh, to the commissioner of police to give license uh, to residents or the ind indigents of the state to defend themselves uh, and all of that. But the government of Zamfara said that they are in talks with the president uh, to enable them achieve this. Uh, where do you see this going? They are in talks with the president to see how it goes. The president will not sign any executive order because even the Supreme Court has uh, defeated him uh, executive order 9. And uh, again, uh, when um, the governor, Matawali, just gave the order to uh, Balakorios, uh, the c commissioner of police, to ensure it, it goes beyond the commissioner of police. If you're talking of arming citizens, there has to be a law. Is there a law on ground? So, and you so I, want to, I want to assume that uh, the governor should know that the commissioner does not have the powers to issue those licenses. Absolutely. But yeah. the IG does. So perhaps his link to the IG is through the commissioner in the state. Yes, but you see, they're talking of massive ownership of, of these guns. 
as opposed to some individuals applying. Yes, some people can apply. You, you can apply to have some pump action, not AK-47, uh, to, to, to a kind of um, uh, protect yourself and your immediate uh, family or environment, should there be. But you see, there are controlled items. AK-47, Uzi. Uh, AK, uh, they, they all are controlled uh, items. Uh, therefore, there is a limitation as to which gun uh, should be used. Well, AK-47 is a superior operational vehicle that belongs to either the army or military in general. Well, the Zambara State the, the, government intends to go about it in a controlled manner, according to what the governor said. They are going to have forms, about 500 of them, and they're going to send them to the 19 local government areas of the state. So there are, those are application forms. The people are going to pick them. So they're going to have an idea of the people that are applying for those guns. I agree with you, but you see, why don't they go the ways of the southwest? The entire region just decided to form what they call Amotekun, the leopard. And of course, they're always going into the forest. And before they move, they move with the police and civil defense corps. But right so now, the Amotekun we... has raised this concern that they are not armed, you know, that they have been seeking to be armed and they are not armed. So but see, at the end of the day, it defeats the whole purpose. Yes, you see, but there should be a proper starting point. If Zamfara goes alone, I mean, you have Brinningwari that is also a neighbor. You have Kaduna State that is also a neighbor. See Sokoto. So if we have the entire Northwest Zone, seven states doing this at the same time, and when it's like you blow a whistle, so 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 time, take everybody with speed, surprise, and accuracy. You you, you see that you achieve results. Now, if Zamfara State succeeds, for example, and chases away some of these people, of course they move to Brindingwari, where indeed in Brindingwari there are some farms before you pass, they're telling you yes, you but, have to but, pay. But, but for the governor, he is, he is the chief security officer of his own state. He cannot take responsibility, yes, uh, responsibility by constitution, for the whole region. Yes, he, uh, that's why I said they should come together. There's always this uh, progressive governor's forum. Why is it a progressive? There is that of northern governor's forum. Why is it so? So but, what but are they if for he doesn't get the cooperation of the others, what does he do? Like we had the governor of Kaduna State. He thinks differently about this. He is thinking more about mercenaries, not, uh, you know, uh, arming of the indigents in the state. So but you can see, see the difference. Let, let, me let me tell you something. At the point when some people accused former president, good luck, Jonathan, of bringing in some mercenary to, to clear ground for an elections were held in 2015, I, I mean, if it is uh, possible, I think I should recommend to the federal government of Nigeria. Honestly, these people are holding us to ransom. At the point, see what you've read in the, in the Daily Trust today, that some bandits in Plato have given five villages look room to evacuate. If you go to Brindingwari, they are even saying that uh, Brindingwari local government of Kaduna State. Bandits are saying anybody caught with a political poster is in soup. You don't, you don't okay. display. You know, just a moment, Stella. We should not allow these miscreants to make laws within Nigeria. We should show that we are in charge. We should show that we are the dominant factor. We okay. should show that we are in control. Which is okay. why, the Which is why has come you to know, the for instance. Yes, but yeah. you see, you see, for the governor is a drop in the ocean. I want it done collectively. If it is done in such a way that uh, uh, some people in authority are saying he is incapable, it's already a problem. I want it by way of um, uh, negotiation, by way of consultation. Look, but you know, you'd have done quite a lot behind the scene. Consult these people. What do we do? But you know, there and, was a time the governors of the Northwest came together for an on an agreement on this, and that uh, did not work perfectly. Now, my question is: Recently, Governor of uh, Kaduna State called for the use of mercenaries. He was attacked. Now the governor of uh, Zamfara is calling for the arming of the people. He has been attacked. The fact that these people have come up with unconventional means of tackling this problem, doesn't that tell you something? Yeah, you see, you see we cannot just uh, continue that way. And not just uh, also recall that uh, the same Zamfara, uh, Masari in Katsina, at the point they said, look, let us simply sign agreement. Come, bring your AK-47, we'll give you this money. And uh, some of them started... But we saw how AK. that went. It and didn't work. Of course, it failed. At the point, these guys are deceived. They look, they, they are a group of uh, de de deceivers, uh, led by Belotruji. He's there 
feeling he's, he's an alternate uh, uh, governor. But I want to, if the federal government, state security services, the military, everybody, civil defense corps, I tell you it is doable. And but where see, it is possible, at the fact that go, the conventional uh, ways have not worked. Uh, the, the, shouldn't we be looking elsewhere? The conventional ways have not worked. The security forces that we have on ground are said to be inadequate to be able to cover for all the needs that we have. So, so what? if the conventional ways are not working, shouldn't we be adopting unconventional methods of dealing with this? What does it take for us to recall those who have just retired and are willing? They are available. They are capable. And we provide them are with all these things. Willing? Are they actually and, willing? And are they able to? These are able, pensioners, able, no, these, these are pensioners who have protested time and time Ex again yeah. over their bene you see, uh, benefits you see, and, and the rest of them. In spite of all of this, I want to tell you that if you blow that whistle, we want to recall, after all, check many, that, of these countries, yes, Stella, the check many of these countries that what you call reservists. And in terms of military training, where is our reserve? These are people you, you can recall. And if you now feel that, there are some people, and I tell you, if the military were to do or is to do what is called um, a recall, and you see that many people who want, who want to engage you in the next uh, two years to clear the bushes, and you see that people will come. And I recommend, I so recommend, it is doable, it is doable. Rather than um, uh, every time you Do you, you really get, believe that so, retirees will be able to fight this battle? Why not? No, honestly, there are some people who indeed are ready. Let them try. It's not about being ready. I, it's about I, I, yes, being was, able to do. There was even a time with this terrain you... because you know there are some experts that have said that this is more of an asymmetric warfare, and it's not something that our retirees are likely familiar with. You see, if you are talking of the desert war, tell me the desert war that is more than Meduguria and Co. that these soldiers have not done. Is it the creek war in the Niger Delta area? Is it the mangrove area? Don't you have uh, marine police? Don't you have uh, amphibious brigades in the army? We have all of them. What is the Navy doing? That's also their area of uh, expertise. So when you say they won't just know the terrain, where are they from? You know, you have people who indeed know these areas like the palms of their hands. And so I think that it, it, it will just sweep it under the carpet to say, no, they will know. Okay, if they don't know, what's the alternative? Even if you were to bring a machinery from abroad, be it South Africa, America, Russia, or wherever, I want to tell you that they will still have to be led by people people who indeed know the terrain. And I want to tell you quickly, which is my why, point which to the, is my the point to, having of the, yes, having the my indigenous point to come on board just, is very crucial, yes, isn't it? My going to the northeast with some of these soldiers, I want to tell you that I've had this to sleep in the trenches with them, truly. The rain will meet us, cold will meet every mosquito will meet us there. Uh, people get attacked before my very uh, uh, eyes. Soldiers get killed, but I thank God I, I, I survived. But I want to tell you that this is also always been done with the civilian, civilian JTF. These are areas, I mean, uh, youths who indeed know the terrain. Because soldiers will come in from Akwa Ebron, from Sokoto, from uh, Ekiti, from, and they move to these areas. Mark you know, the Nigerian military is a mini Nigeria where everyone belongs. But if you don't know the environment, in order to penetrate, you have to have youths around the, uh, the, the, the right. area okay. who indeed know. All and right. sometimes you also have hunters who hunt. They know every stream. Right. And you. you do your assessment before you unleash your operations. All right. Thank you so much uh, for your thoughts uh, on this. Uh, we'll continue to interrogate these issues uh, as they unveil. Uh, we look forward to having you again. My pleasure. Our guest reviewer has been Ben Chairman, Director of News Voice of Nigeria. We'll take a short breather now, and then when we come back on the top of the hour, we'll take a look at the headlines again and some of the stories making the rounds. Please stay with us. <music>
right, thank you for staying. You're watching Daybreak reaching you live from the nation's capital in Abuja. It's top of the hour. Let's take a look at the headlines again. Banditry Matawale insists on self-defense, inaugurates committees, deploys vehicles and bikes. Salah Sultan directs Muslims to look out for new moon. EFCC, landlords who have Yahoo boys as tenants risk 15-year jail term. Now the news and details. Governor Bello Matawale of Zamfara State has inaugurated four committees on security matters and provided 20 brand new Hilux vehicles and 1,500 motorbikes for the commencement of operations. The press secretary to, gov to the governor, Jamilu Ilyasu Magaji, disclosed this on Tuesday. The committees are Special Committee on Intelligence Gathering on Banditry, Management Committee on Operations of the Commun Community Protection Guards, Committee on Prosecution of Banditry-Related Offenses, and Sec State Security Standing Committee. Matawale said the establishment of the committees was part of the tireless efforts of his administration to address the prolonged problem of banditry plaguing the state and other states in the Northwest Zone. Al Haji Saad Abubakar III, the Sultan of Sokoto and President General of Nigeria, Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, has directed the Muslim Ummah to look out for the new moon of Zuhijjah as from Wednesday. The Sultan made the call in a statement signed by Professor Sambo Junaidu, Chairman, Advisory Committee on Religious Affairs, Sultanate Council, Sokoto. He also prayed to Allah to assist the Muslim Ummah in discharging their religious duties. So Hijjah is the 12th and the last month in the Islamic calendar where the holy pilgrimage takes place as well as the Eid Kabir festival of sacrifice. Now the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, has vowed to go after landlords who rent their houses to internet fraudsters known as Yahoo Boys. The commission made this known ahead of its next edition of its public conversation series tagged EFCC Connect, which has been slated for 6 p.m. on Wednesday. The topic, Give Your House to Yahoo Boys, Spend 15 Years in Jail, will be discussed by the Commission's legal and prosecution officers, Silvanus Tahir and Cosmos Ugu. Daily Trust reports that the EFCC had repeatedly warned house owners and commercial real estate agents against making properties available to cyber criminals and fraud stars. Now let's take a look at some more packages. Hundreds of intended pilgrims in Kano are protesting non-allocation of hard slots despite making full payments for the pilgrimage. Kano State Pilgrims Welfare Board confirms that the board is still waiting for allocation of hard seats from National Hard Commission. Correspondent Idris Debrin reports that the protesters expressed shock over non-allocation of hard slot despite making full payments. Let's take a look. These are 280 intending pilgrims under the hard savings schemes, which they paid their money to Jai's Bank in Kanu. But few days to go, there seems to be no future for them, and the explanation seems unsatisfactory. According to these people, Jai's Bank has debited their account, which they sent to both National Hajj Commission and Kano State Pilgrims Welfare Board. But the board is giving them no assurance of going to the Holy Land. You see, Kano Pilgrim Board has collected all our traveling documents. But now they are telling us that there is no allocation of seats. That is why we came to Jai's to seek for answers. Because we were debited since last week. They took 401,000 naira to Kano Pilgrims Welfare Board and 2,050,000 naira to National Hajj Commission. But yet they are still telling us that there is no seat allocation to us. Meanwhile, the Kano State Pilgrims Welfare Board says so far there is no allocation from National Hajj Commission in the name of those pilgrims of the Hajj Saving Schemes from Jai's Bank. But the board is hoping to get some anytime soon. When the issue of Hajj Savings Scheme came up, I visited the National Hajj Commission more than 10 times to explain the lack of seat allocation for Kano, hoping that it will improve. Myself, 
and the governor himself were promised repeatedly by the commission, yet there are no allocation coming to us. So these people, we are only hoping that this allocation will come so that we will include them. But honestly, it's getting late. As intending pilgrims all over the country begins to arrive to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, these people can only hope for change, which is highly unlikely at the moment. Idris Jibren, Trust TV News, Kanu. It's an unfortunate situation because... Quite unfortunate, you know, looking at the fact that, you know, the slots for Nigeria has dropped. Yeah. Uh, for the Hajj itself, generally. It's about 43,000. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you could see, you would expect uh, naturally that there will be a drop in the number of uh, the pilgrims yeah. that will be embarking on the exercise uh, yearly. And so some people will definitely be affected. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they will be able to eventually go, that's... Uh, that they are closing the airport on the third. I mean, exactly. Yeah, so, so just uh, three days away. I mean, for some of them, it's not going to be... Uh, it's going to be a, a painful one. They mm -hmm. will have to be sacrificing a lot. And with the rising inflation, who knows? How much it will next cost next year. How much is going mm. to be. You know, they may have to pay more and all that. So it's a sad one. Yeah, all right. On to the next report. Issues around the electoral art came to the front burner at the opening of plenary this Tuesday. Senate President Ahmed Lawan has said the National Assembly will work towards amending the electoral art to serve as safeguard against witnesses identified in the law. Now let's take the report. The Senate President, Hamed Lawa, in a short remark on Tuesday during plenary, assured of the amendment to the Electoral Act following a matter of national importance brought to the floor by Senator Yaya Abdullah. Rising under Order 42 of the Senate Standing Orders, Senator Abdullah lauded the Ninth Assembly for resisting the pressure from the Executive to amend Section 84, Subsection 12 of the Electoral Act 2022. He also applauded the Supreme Court for the clarity in the verdict upholding the separation of powers principle entrenched in the 1999 Constitution. The Supreme Court verdict should be celebrated for two reasons. The first one is that it restored and anchors the power of making laws in the National Assembly. The second one is that it established a principle that once a president assents to a bill, he or she cannot appropriate and reprobate. He or she cannot go to the courts to amend or reject the bill in part or in whole. This is a major principle that has emerged from this particular judgment. Lawal, in his remarks, described the judgment by the Supreme Court on Section 84, Subsection 12 of the Electoral Act as a landmark judgment that vindicates the National Assembly. The electoral processes and procedures in our country. So it's for us to ensure that where there are weaknesses, we try to come up with measures, amendments, to deal with issues of weaknesses in the law. And I'm sure it will come full cycle by the time the 2023 20, general elections are held. The APS call had on Friday struck out a suit filed by President Mamadou Buhari and his Attorney General Abubakar Malami to challenge the controversial Section 84, Subsection 12 of the Electoral Act. All right, now President Muhammad Buhari says that the All Progressives Congress will reconcile all parties aggrieved uh, as a result of the party's nationwide primaries well uh, ahead of the 2023 general elections. He spoke on Tuesday at the State House in Abuja when he met with a delegation of senators. Take a look. The APC is in dire straits given the number of persons appealing the results of its recently concluded primaries. A quick peek at the number of appeals arising from the exercise reveals that there are over 47 cases in the South-South, 10 in the Southeast, 4 in the Southwest, and that is not the end of the list. President Buhari is very much aware of the state of things. The leadership of the party is currently addressing 
the outcomes as part of the way forward. I am encouraging all the party functionaries to adhere to the truth and to be fair to all parties in any dispute. This is important because our strength and victory in the election lies in the unity of the party and our ability to prevent or heal any injustice perceived or real. And he is giving assurances that justice will prevail. Aggrieved members shall be assuaged and the interests of the party and the nation shall be protected. The sooner the ruling party resolves this looming internal crisis, the better. Or there could be dire consequences. In fact, whispers indicate that about 22 senators are aggrieved by the primaries in the Senate. And they are all threatening to explore a plan B if they don't get justice. It could mean that going into the 2023 elections, the ruling party may lose its majority in the Red Chamber. From State House Abuja. Kainde Amudu, Trust TV News. All right, thank you, Kainde Amudu, for that report. We'll take a short break now. When we come back, we're going to our first discussion for the day. Please stay. All right, thank you for staying with us. Now we'll begin our first discussion on the directive given by the governor of Zamfara State, uh, Matawale, uh, to, for citizens to obtain guns and defend themselves, uh, and then subsequent reactions uh, by the chief of uh, defense staff. We also uh, have in the studio a security expert, Stephen Okore, uh, to talk to us about this uh, recent development. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Daybreak. Thank you for inviting me. All right. So uh, despite all the reactions that have trailed this uh, directive by the governor of uh, Zamfara State, he seemed to be, uh, you know, uh, insistent. He seemed to be convinced that this is the way to go. He has gone ahead to inaugurate four committees uh, to dispatch uh, 20 vehicles and 1,500 motorbikes to the committee to work with. So uh, what's your take on this? Is this the way to go? Looking at the fact that all other options have been exhausted, sort of. Yeah, from your introduction, uh, you, you say that all options have been uh, exhausted by the governor. Uh, this is a, a man that uh, inherited all this when he came to power. Uh, what do you expect from a man that is frustrated? I'll use the word frustrated because uh, he has tried to see, use different means. Uh, the, we have seen that uh, the kinetic approach was not working for him. He tried to see how to approach it through the non-kinetic means by granting amnesty, uh, negotiations, dialogue, um, reconciliation, and all that. He has used virtually every means of that he, that he knows best that he can see that can help quell the situations in, a, in a Zamfara State. But from all indications, it is still, a, still on the rise. It's still increasing. His uh, citizens that he's governing are being killed on a daily basis and all that. So for me, uh, I think it's a, one of is one of the ways to go, you know, uh, but application and implementation, uh, they should critically look into it, you know. Uh, you know, the laws governing uh, uh, firearms, you know, and licenses in Nigeria is approved by either the president or the IGP of uh, the Inspector General of Police, you know. So, uh, if such uh, licenses can be given, 
there's nothing wrong with it. In any case, what kind of arms are we even talking about? Because uh, from what I know, yeah. the laws allows for just the use of shotguns. Mm. So uh, what kind of arms are we looking at here for the citizens or the indigents of Zonfer State uh, are going to be using to defend themselves, really? If, will shotgun be able to serve that purpose? And if not shotgun, then what else does the law allow for? I think they, they critically need to look at what the law stipulates clearly, you know. And uh, going by that, they can as well go to see how to apply what the law states clearly in it, you know, for the citizens or group of people to see how to have this uh, arms and ammunition, you know. I, we saw where the, the, the chief of defense staff was saying on TV where he talked about uh, the, gov the governor does not have the powers to issue such instructions or something. But this is a man that, uh, as a father of the state, you know, he keeps seeing his, uh, his children dying. Let me just say that. He keeps seeing his children dying on a daily basis. Of course, you should expect that he should derive every means possible to see how to protect them. Because it's his duty to see how to protect lives and the properties of his citizens. All right, beyond the law, let's imagine that there's a law that says... It's okay, fine. People can go ahead and buy these arms and own them. Wouldn't it be chaotic? I mean, imagine every Nigerian having been in possession of an arm. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a problem? Because a lot of people who have condemned the call yeah. have based their condemnation on the fact that it's a call to anarchy, as it were. Yes. They are, they are entitled to their opinion to say that, you know. But we have seen situations where, for America, in America, for instance, there's a law that permits that uh, if you are either 18 years or 21 years of age, you can only go. A law that, a says, law that, a law that certain people have come out to que query and a, question all the time. Yes. They have come out to query all the time, you know, because of the bad guys that own these guns. But it doesn't mean that we don't have good guys that own the guns. Even the fact that they have queried it all the time, if you begin to look at the crime rate in America, that such law exists, even the crime rate in America is far, far, far lower than what we are experiencing in Nigeria. The crime rate in, our, in, in Nigeria is about 16%. Well, Nigeria is at the level of 16th position. America that will talk about this kind of laws, do you know that crime rate, they are on the 56th position. So the crime rate in Nigeria is even far, far higher than that of America, where they, they have laws where uh, 18 years or 21 years can only gun. The worry is for whether or not our systems, yes. the structure we, we have, mm. can be able to manage this uh, arrangement. Yes. Because uh, you know, a lot of people have pointed to the flaws in the system, how weak it is. So who holds who to account? If, you know, paraventure you have people in possession of these firearms, and uh, you know they are, they are abusing it. Mm -hmm. You know how do we checkmate it? I talked about application and implementation. You see, once we put a policy in place, our duty is to see that uh, we follow the policy to the letter. How do you go about it? The implementation, the application. But in Nigeria here, we keep jumping guns. We just we cut corners to see how to uh, apply certain things that should be for our benefit. But in, um, in making the pronouncement, the yes. governor, yes. would it have been better if he had categorized it, for instance, to say every head of family can own a gun, mm. instead of just leaving it open? Would it have been better? If I was to be the governor, I would put it in such a way that a group of recognized Nigerians, not just individuals, a group of recognized Nigerians, for instance, if you bring on board the vigilante group, you know, Every community has vigilante groups. I, I, I make bold to say that every community has vigilante groups. So you can harness these groups together, you know, categorize them, give them a name. Well, by the time you uh, mark, by the time you provide these ammunitions and guns, you mark them so that for record purpose, you know that this X, Y, Z group, they have these kind of guns and they are, they are marked. Another group in the different communities that we have in Zamfara State, once you mark these, you mark these guns and ammunition, at least you can trace the event where they misuse it, you know. So I think that implementation is the way to go. And once we put proper check and we, we implement the ideal thing that he wants to do, 
you know, I, we will get results. These people, self-defense, don't forget that it's a natural instinct, you know, and it has been part of us. It has been part of uh, human survival strategy. You know, you cannot take self-defense away from, from human beings. You know, by the time you, you go, you, you properly put in place the way he is going, number of motorbikes, number of cars and all that, and these vehicles and motorbikes are marked, you know, and people that are heading the structures at that community level, you can be able you, to get results. Do you really think that this arrangement will be efficient enough to deal with this? Now, he talks about 500 uh, forms yes. per uh, Emirate Council, 19 Emirate Council. Yes. We are talking about 9,500 uh, guns, yes. so to say, for the entire state. Would that be enough to deal with the kind of problem that we're dealing with? And can they really confront these bandits? If you look at the fact that you know you need training as well and other kinds of you know uh, you know uh, understanding mm -hmm. to be able to deal with this. What is it that they have on ground now? They don't absolutely have anything on the ground. So for me, the best way to, to go about it is to start something. By the time you start something and you are seeing results, as time goes on, you begin to see where a manner to improve on it. We are talking about lives and property here. Every day people die. So by the time you start, you must start something. And as you start something, you begin to see the gap. And going forward, you begin to see how to close the gap. But we have had allegations where we hear that some vigilante members yes. in some communities connive with yes. these bandits. Yes. How are we sure that these arms yes. will not end up in the hands of the bandits? I put it to you that there are stakeholders, various stakeholders in all these communities that we are talking about here. Especially, okay, let's, we are, we are, our focus is on Zamfara. Every community in Zamfara, there's a district head or a, an emir or something. That's a traditional mm -hmm. law, right? Mm -hmm. There's either a mosque or a church in one of the communities or the other. So the emir or the district head or the village head, the imam or the pastor or whoever, and other age grade group of boys or youths, you know, that form different associations within these communities. They can put themselves together as stakeholders in this community. That means for this to work, there must be the will, not just on the part of the government, but on the part of the people, exactly. the commitment of the people. The, Are you sure yes. we have that commitment of the people to actually tackle this? When they see their people dying, why won't commitment be there? They, are, they, they see their people dying. These bandits come day, night, and kill their people. Of course, there will be commitment. So by the time they say, okay, let us let them harmonize, put themselves together, and see how to work with the security agencies and the government as well, they will bring out people that are trustworthy, that if they know that uh, you have a questionable character, you won't be part of uh, the, the team or the group of vigilante that are putting together. Are you concerned that there could be some high level of extrajudicial killings as a result of this. We've heard stories about uh, the vigilante group, mm. I think it in Kazamfara or Katsina, yeah. and Sake or something mm. like that, uh, how, you know, sometimes they go uh, overboard, they go and they, you know, they perpetrate certain things against innocent uh, citizens, yes. simply for mere, you know, uh, misunderstanding or maybe for for hate or just, you know, dislike for, yeah. for persons and yeah. then they, they just go after them, you know, and all of that. That's why I talk about the recruitment process. The, during the recruitment process, there must be proper background check on anybody that you, they want to recruit or bring on board to serve as a member of a vigilante group. You know, we talked about training here. There should be physical and mental tests. It takes a whole lot to do it. You not just go pick somebody from the street and begin to say, or come and give him gun to begin to operate as a member of the vigilante group. There are processes that they must follow. Okay, so shouldn't those processes have been started yes. before this pronouncement? pronouncement. pronouncement. I, I don't know how far the, uh, the, the governor or the government of Zambia have gone in terms of uh, the processes, you know, 
But uh, from what uh, you have presented here, we saw that uh, even vehicles and motorbikes have been bought. Yes, yeah, so yeah. These, the, 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 the governor inaugurated four committees. Yes. A uh, special committee on intelligence gathering on banditry, mm -hmm. uh, management committee on operations of the community, yes. protection guards uh, committee on prosecution of banditry uh, related offenses, and then state security uh, standing committee. Yes. So these are some of the committees that were set up, whether or not they will be able to efficiently yes. and effectively carry out this because, mandate yeah. is one thing. Uh, don't you think that there's some kind of need for collaboration with the federal government uh, in this regard? Yes, there is need for collaboration because uh, going forward, uh, he needs to deal with uh, the, the regular or the formal uh, security agencies and team that he achieves what he wants to achieve. So there is need for collaboration with, uh, with the federal government. But from, where, from what it looks like right yes, now, he yes. doesn't have that cooperation. Because if you listen to the remark by the chief of defense staff, mm. he disapproved of this arrangement. Uh, even the commissioner of police in the state says that he has not been given any directive. Yeah. So apparently he's waiting for an instruction from the inspector general of police, police yeah. to, you know, to, to do anything. So yeah. that collaboration, are you likely to see it happen? It must happen. But from uh, what the committees that you have read up, uh, there's nothing wrong with the committees. Because everything has to do with uh, trying to see that uh, the, the Gambara state is safe and secure, you know, going down to the grassroots because crimes are local, you know. So for him to actually get a result, those committees are, are in order. And uh, I want to advise that uh, they should uh, put, uh, set aside sentiments and politics, you know, in trying to see how to achieve that because it has to do with security, you know. So he has to have a point or bring on board professionals, you know, security professionals, both private and uh, retired uh, officers and uh, uh, personnel that have retired from service to see that that thing works. And, you know. and in getting this to work, the police in the state has to work with the vigilante members. Obviously, certainly. Do you truly believe that these two groups will work together? Because the police will feel that, oh, we are the trained ones, we're the professionals here. Mm -hmm. You are a vigilante member. Mm -hmm. There must be a synergy. I, I put it to you that uh, if you go to check now, uh, the, the commissioner of police in Zamfara is not from the state. So for him to work and get results, he must definitely work with the local vigilante. Because you know there are certain features that come with uh, vigilante uh, members or group. Of course, you know that they are more familiar with the, their environment and the terrain and all that. So if you bring a police officer to come and work with, uh, the man should be after result because uh, People, with, people that are dying, it's not, it's not funny. So the, the commissioner of police should be after results. So, and the best way to go is the synergy, to work in synergy with the government and the vigilante. Well, group. you know, there's been allegations that there are certain people who do not want all of this crisis to end because they are benefiting. Yes. Now, we really do not know those who are benefiting. You can't know that. Yes, so... But we have seen that uh, a lot of them have, have become millionaires from the fight against insecurity. Exactly. So those people benefiting, don't you see them as a cog in the, the wheel, uh, frustrating the entire process? Mm. Yes. But uh, the, the, it, it, we don't deter uh, the government or the security agencies from uh, going ahead to do what they need to do. The fact that they are amongst them, you know, but it won't deter them from doing the constitutional responsibility they are supposed to perform. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, another argument is whether or not Zamfara State... Uh, alone can yes. be able to, you know, do this without the other regional uh, cooperation. So, for instance, you have neighboring states who are probably not doing the same, yes. who are not thinking in the same direction. Uh, will it be possible for them, you know, alone as a state to be able to do that when you have these bandits in other neighboring states and all of that? How possible is it? Uh, uh, that's, I think that's the, where the special advisor to the governors and security. I, I want to believe that all governors have special advisors on security. So the governors, the special advisors from the states surrounding Zamfara, I expect that well, this time they should all be working together to see that that region or political, geopolitical zone is properly uh, secured and safe for, this, for their citizens, you know. So at this point, I expect that they should be putting up policies and the uh, framework to see that uh, what the, uh, the suggestion coming from uh, the government of Zamfara, 
you know, if they apply it. And I want to believe that this what the governor is trying to do, if you apply it in other states, it will work. It will work. Shouldn't there be a test case first? Test case? Yes, let them start and then maybe see how as, it goes. As you, as you are doing it, as the test case is going on in Zamfara, don't forget that the bandits are relocating if it's affecting them. You understand? They are relocating to other states. So I think there's nothing wrong with starting something. The region started holistically. You know, as they put on, a, as they fire the, the bandits or terrorists and all that, they begin to look out for other, possibly go out of the, 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 the country, you know, to other state, other countries, you know. Well, you know, uh, Stephen, a lot of people are skeptical about this. Uh, mm -hmm. We've heard stories about other countries that have gone mm -hmm. this path and mm -hmm. it doesn't look like they ended well. I mean, Libya is a classical example mm -hmm. uh, of what we are talking about, where everyone has access to firearm. At the end of the day, you find several groups, you know, within the same territory, uh, fighting each other for power. For so, the the thing is that the problem may not even be with, you know, fighting the bandits themselves, but it is about when the fighting with the bandits is over. Mm. What then happens? Because, you know, if you are able to defeat the bandits, yes. and you still have citizens or indigents having guns, guns. what then happens? Don't forget, I mentioned about documentation as well. Every community, as you provide the names of people that are members of vigilante, we're, we're talking about proper thing. It's not just a, a haphazard uh, arrangement. Yes, but disarmament is something that you know will take someone who is involved to be willing to do. Uh, if the people carrying the arms are not willing to be disarmed at the end of the day, what happens? I mean, yes, they are documented. Yes. The, 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 the authorities probably know where they are mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. But if they decide to abscond and, you know, decide to pose a threat, they can be traced. And also, we have the elections coming on. What can, if? Can, are you saying that we don't have good Nigerians that can do this job? We have good Nigerians that can serve this, uh, uh, this to do what we are talking about. So why don't, they, why so don't we, we just begin... absorb them in the, in the, in the, in the security services? Instead of going this way, I mean, mm. let them just join the police, join the military, you know, other platforms that they can render such services instead of, you know, just opening up for citizens to, to carry arms. Just the way, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's also a way to go about it. Calling, a, you know, states have talked about state police, you know. So when you talk about state police, the state police, when they are recruited from their, from their local uh, community and all that, they can as well remain in their communities. Eh, empowered with guns and other ammunition and serve the purpose of a uh, vigilante as well because they were or they were recruited from their immediate community so they are going to serve in their own community so it's as well as well you know one concern that people have always had against yes. state police is about a politician or uh, hijacking, uh, hijacking mm -hmm. it, the process mm -hmm. now whoever is in charge at the time this vigilante people are armed with the arms mm -hmm. uh he's in charge right at that point of so he they will listen to him. Yes. He can use them. Yes. Now they have these arms. Yes. What will stop him from using them against his opponents? Well, I've seen politicians even using federal police. It happened in New Imo and all that and some other states. So that fear must always be there. But it shouldn't stop us, you know, from providing or preferring solutions to the challenges we are facing at the moment. You know, so basically, we need arms and ammunition to be able to tackle the challenges we are talking about. Because you see innocent people lying in their, sleeping in their houses or in their communities and all that. Then these people just come with guns and begin to kill them. But there's also the issue of the kind of arms those people come with. Yes. So even by the time you approve this, like he asked earlier, yes. what kind of arms are you going to give to those people? Is it going to be the type that will match the one the bandits are going to come with? Let us start with something. At least there's provision in the, in the, in the, in the law that, 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 pro makes, uh, that provides for the kind of arm that they can carry. Let us start with something. It's not by holding bows and arrows that we know that it won't go anywhere. So it's better we start with something. As time goes on, we can see how to improve on it. You know, we're talking about solutions here, you know. So I, you agree with me that the, the, the law enforcement are overwhelmed. They are basically overwhelmed. It's, it's obvious. You cannot say that they are handling the issues and people are dying every day, you know. So 
It's just like uh, a father leaving his house and the children are hungry. You go and come back and you say there's no money and they still remain hungry, you know. So where's the hope, you know? So if you are handling the issues, let us see that you are handling it. People are not dying. People are not being killed. Do you, th do you see this action or step by the Zamfara state government? Do you see it? Do you think that the federal government will see it as a wake-up call? Because what the Zamfara state government is saying that I'm not getting help from anywhere and that's why I'm going this way. Yes. Do you think that that will cause the federal government to do more? It's a challenge. For me, it's a challenge. Number one, you know that the, 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 the conventional security agencies are owned by the government, the federal government. So it's a challenge on the government, on the part of the federal government, to see how to improve on whatever they are doing. Increase the number of uh, personnel or manpower, improve on the, on the technology, improve on the ammunition and, uh, and weapons and all that. You have to improve on all this. So there are a lot of things that the federal government needs to do. But since the man in the helm of affairs in Zamfara is not saying that and his people are being killed, he's trying to derive what that means. I want to I want to encourage other governors to see how to see how to go that that way. Mind you that my position about individuals having guns or owning guns is not I, I, I'm not in support of it, but it can be classified. You know, according to groups, you know that this same, this this category of group have this, and it's on record that they have, and the guns are marked, and it's applicable to other other groups. You know, so that it's a structure, and there must be a leader that must report to the police. And it must work in synergy with the police because we're talking about internal crime here. All right. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Stephen O'Corey, for joining us on Daybreak and sharing your perspectives uh, with us on this. Uh, we look forward to having you again. Thank you for yeah. inviting me. All right, we'll now take a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll take a look at other issues on the program. Please stay with us.
right, thank you for staying. If you are just joining, you're watching Daybreak, reaching you live from the nation's capital in Abuja, right here on Trust Television. Now, the organized labor in Ogun State on Monday declared an indefinite strike over the pathetic plight of workers in the state. The strike, which takes effect from 12 a.m. on Tuesday, will affect ministries, agencies, hospitals, and public schools. We have joining us via phone the NLC uh, chairman in Ogun State, Emmanuel Bankole, uh, to talk about this. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Mr. Emmanuel. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be with you. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, take us through why you are embarking on the strike at this moment. Well, thank you very much. We have a number of issues that have been uh, on ground for so long now, and uh, all efforts to meet the governor uh, prove abortive. And uh, this issue are uh, things that affect the welfare and well-being of workers, as well as retirees in the state. Courts on the table is the issue of the unlimited deductions, which has uh, been about 21 months now. The government will deduct from workers' salary and fail to remit to appropriate places like the issue of the cooperative society, uh, national civil fund, and others. So as we speak, the cooperative society in Ogun City is practically paralyzed now. And we're saying, how can you hold a money for 21 months? And to come and speak with us, talk with the first edition, uh, you are so busy. So it's one of the reasons. Again, we have the issue of uh, um, uh, leave allowance. It's about eight years now on the table. You know what? We also have issue of contributing pension. As we speak in Ogun State, the contributing pension is more important. The government has been deducting for about 160 months. It has been a carry over from one administration to the other. They will deduct and they will not let it to PFA. So, jeopardizing the future of workers in the coast. I will say, no, this cannot continue. We must sit and talk about it. If it's not working, let us revive back to the whole uh, uh, pension scheme. So, it's fine. Again, we have the issue of the uh, uh, areas of uh, gratuity on grant. We spoke with this government to agree to 500 million every quarter. And we're saying that 500 million, million is grossly inadequate compared to the number of people that don't grant that they should increase that uh, quarterly allocation so that good number of pensioners can be taken care of. Why alive? Why alive? You don't want to use the money for their burial to their ordinary day money. We also have the issue of. Uh, <laughs> Alright. As we speak now, in the state, we, these issues are so germane, they don't. They not only affect our today, but even our future as workers in the state. And we wrote to government in April to meet the governor. Uh, we have uh, some top government, government of the functionary, the methods that governor was agree and that as far as he called, we uh, deliver a message. That was done. Uh, we waited to June. No words from the government. We wrote another letter in June asking to see the governor within two weeks. The two weeks lapsed without work from government. From government, so we get another seven days. We didn't wish to speak with us, come to the table, no words until the last day. And that was why we have to go on strike. Perhaps maybe that's the only time we know we are serious about the issue of grant. So that's why we are strike now. All right, Mr. Bankole, um, you called a seven-day strike. You you gave a, a seven-day seven warning. warning. You I gave a, a seven-day warning strike. Uh, which elapsed on Monday and Tuesday, 12 a.m., you embarked on this indefinite strike. Uh, some persons have, are saying that the reason nobody listened to you or said anything was because the governor was out of the state. Is that true? If you continue, governor, you continue, there can't be a vacuum. We wrote, uh, I said we wrote in April with the promise that at the end they the will get across the road. This is May June. Early June, we wrote. Two weeks. He's been in and out of the state. It's not that he's been in the state for all this long. So, no, so that, that would not be. Like, all right, there, there are reports that uh, there's a meeting today. Can you confirm yeah. that? Yes. Uh, after our declaration of strike, you know, uh, we later in the day received a letter of invitation inviting us to a meeting today at 12 o'clock. Okay. So, um, you have mentioned uh, a lot of things that, uh, a lot of grievances that the workers in the state have. Uh, 
if for whatever reason the government is not able to meet all of your demands, is there any chance uh, you could there could be a compromise? Well, um, I'm to the table, you know, uh, the sincerity, openness, and commitment to determine, you know how we take them, because these are carryover from, most of these are carryover from previous administration, and we have been engaging even this government, and it's about three years plus now. So, uh, we want to see that commitment, which we take our deadline of action. All right. Well, um, quite a number of issues, really. Do, do, do you also think that there are other ways of dealing with this, aside from uh, this strike at this point in time. I mean, there are those who will say, well, uh, you have not exhausted all the options that there are that you should have before embarking on this. Yeah, no other means it's not again. We've exhausted not even on grant. It was because we're used to the war. You can recall writing, calling for attention, let us talk. Because as labor leader, we know that the tool that we use is a social dialogue engagement. And when there's no engagement, they are not any talk with us. I mean, it's like practically pushing us to the wall. So, there are no options again at this critical moment and the strike action that we have a for. Are you concerned about the implications of this on, say, health workers, for, I mean, for, on patients, for instance, in hospitals? Because I understand that this involves even hospitals are going to be shutting down. Uh, yesterday, we saw some videos that went viral on social media how patients are having to, you know, go back uh, to their yes, homes to, or to elsewhere to seek uh, help and all of that. Well, thank you very much. That was why it was a very difficult decision for us to take, very difficult one. But we were pushed to that position, and then we have no option but to do that. Um, we, we took contact of that. The health, the education, even on the socioeconomic uh, life of the state and everybody. And, you know, at a point in time, we just have to take a certain decision. Because instead of dying gradually, people are dying gradually. You, you imagine the pension I see. The minimum pension is 5,000. This is supposed to be reviewed in line with the constitution. The minimum pension, they did not review it. So, some of them, any 5,000. That cannot even buy the drug. So, some people, these are dying people. So, you just have to take group by the home. Yes, sacrifice, you know, uh, we have to come here and there. So that our tomorrow can be uh, sure. So it was a hard decision that we have to take, um, and we hope it's better now, you know, so that um, we can put it in right perspective, and our tomorrow can be sure. It was difficult, but then, uh, uh, thank God, you know, we still have the wrong options in terms of the uh, uh, service delivery. The, uh, the Federal Medical Center also have the reputable um, public that can pick and can stand in that, you know, while it's in land. We hope anyway that the government will not want to toy with uh, uh, such a very serious matter. Mr. Bankali, uh, you said that you wrote several letters, nothing came of, uh, out of that. Are you optimistic about today's meeting? Yes, yes. We'll be going to the table with Uncle Brian, you know, believing that it's our state and all of us must work together to make it work for us. So we'll be going to the table to meet them with open mind with the sincerity and the commitment, you know, that that's what we need at this point in time. All right, thank you so much uh, for joining us, uh, Emmanuel Bankoli, Chairman of the Nigerian Labour Congress in Ogun State. Thank you for joining us on Daybreak this morning. Thank you very much, my pleasure. All right. All right, well, that's that. Uh, we've come to the end of the show for yeah. today. Uh, for those who have missed, you can always catch up via all our social media platforms and also don't forget you can subscribe to our youtube channel to watch more my name is ayuba Ilya. thank you for spending this part of your morning with us do well to, uh, to join us again same time same station tomorrow my name is stella iaji and do have a pleasant day Bye, sir.